So here in Colorado, there's all sorts of conservative women groups and Republican women's groups and all these other empowerment groups that try to work for lower government. And it never really hits us that there's women all around the world fighting for less government. So um, Isabella, I want to make sure I got it. Patria? Patriota. Patriota, very good. <laughs> With Lola, Ladies of Liberty Alliance. Do I have that one right? Yes. I did well. You're from Brazil. Yes. Why did you come here? Well, I moved to the U.S. looking for the American dream. And I Describe it. Describe what the American dream is to somebody in Brazil as you were coming over. Okay. The American dream is to be able to start from the bottom and be able to get where any regular American can get. I'm not going to compare myself with a, an American millionaire, but as an immigrant, I can come to this country and I can get what, on any place that I want if I work hard, just like a regular American. And this is what I believe is the American dream. And that's why I love this country. That's why I chose, and I'm here by myself. I am the only one abroad, and I'm the only one that really speaks English in my family. I came from a regular family in Brazil, and I'm following my dream here. You know, it's funny you say, you know, I'm not going to be a millionaire, but <laughs> nah, it, it's interesting statistically. First generation immigrants, you, are uh, become millionaires like 80% more often than people who were born and raised in America. And it, for me, it, it, I had a hard time buying this statistic because you know, somebody like you comes here, you don't really know the language, you don't know the laws, you don't know the customs, you don't know the culture, you don't have the connections, but still people come to America and within a generation uh, have, have built something. And it, it, it speaks more about American complacency to me than anything else. That from Brazil, you look at America and you go, a person can build their own life there. Do most Brazilians feel that way, or is it just something you see? No, not all, not all Brazilians see like that. And ma many of them see the opposite because they feel that the U.S. is the oppressor of the world. So the poverty that we see in Africa or the poverty that we still have in Brazil are basically consequences of capitalism or how uh, the U.S. puts its uh, trades with the country or how the U.S. behaved years ago during our dictatorship or how the U.S. influenced uh, many policies in, in Brazil. So many Brazilians see, seem to believe that the U.S., the country and the culture uh, is the enemy. So it's not like a place to be free. So, but there are immigrants like me, they're like, Run, ran away, ran away from Brazil. Not my case because I didn't, no. I didn't, I didn't do that way. But why many Brazilians, especially those really in the bottom, are willing to cross the border in bad situations, uh, putting their lives at risk to cross to get a, a normal job here, to be a servant, to to be a cleaner, to be a nanny, and they are doing that because even with these jobs, they are better off than in Brazil. Not everyone can do what you did and come here. Um, and as America turns more and more leftist, I worry about people wanting to come here and wanting to uh, do that American dream. Is the love of liberty, the love of, and I'm talking about the, the simple recipe. It's, it's not mm -hmm. difficult. It's, it's property rights. It's low taxes, low regulation. It's rule of law. It really doesn't take too many things for capitalism to take hold and improve people's lives uh, throughout. What's the mission of your ladies of liberty? Because this is not just a Brazilian thing. This is not just an American thing. Mm -hmm. Our mission is to bring more women to our side. So we are one step ahead of convincing people that uh, liber libertarianism or capitalism is good, but it's to convince women specifically. Because if we see the movement, the liberty movement, for decades, it's pretty much the same. It didn't change. You're going to see the same stereotype of person. It's going to be a white male 
and talking about the same issues, they're not changing. And so if they're not changing, we cannot change the world. If they are not addressing this message to other audiences, how we are going to get this person to be, to stand against certain types of regulation? You, you, you want to change women's viewpoints on capitalism around the world. I'm sorry, we can't even do that here in the nation you thought was the capitalistic dream that you wanted to come here so that you could direct your own life and you could write your own biography. Quite simply, the female vote, particularly the suburban female vote, is overwhelmingly left-leaning in this country and going more so. I've got my own theories on this, but I'd like to hear yours. Why is it that women, more so than men, are scared of capitalism or find it oppressive or what? what is it? Because I'm looking at our country and it is capitalism that has given us the greatest quality of life known to human history. But still, women, as a generalization here, eh, they don't like it. It's, it's mean. Well, and that's our mission. And no offense here, okay, but the liberty movement and the conservative movement, if we put them in the same side, they're not welcoming to women. When women... We, and we're talking about not only oppressions that come by the state, by the law, regulations that are bad. Many countries, in many countries, they have regulations that prevent women to go work, certain type of works, because they use whatever excuse that we know nowadays that doesn't make any sense. And it comes from the state. It, it comes from the government. Many kind of regulations that are bad. So in these countries, it's easier to say, this is the state, this is not capitalism. So it's easier to, to address this message there and say, and this, these laws were made by men. All right, so so if, if we were to go um, and, and go to the Middle East and see the Taliban saying women can't get an education, women can't get jobs, American women would look at that and go, well, that's, that's the state mm -hmm. destroying and oppressing women. But here they look at it and say, no, it's... It's, I don't think they think it's the marketplace. I think they just want a desired outcome. And government gives you a desired outcome. It takes care of your health. Women want their kids to be taken care of. It takes care of your retirement. People want their kids to have a nice retirement. Their education, well, no, we all should do that. It'll feed you. It will do all those nurturing things that I think a lot of suburban women want. So over there, government is oppressing. Over here, government is security. But why? So, okay, so let's start a little bit uh, before. So why does women support this? Because even though it is like a society issue, it doesn't really come from the government. Like when women want to keep their job and, and they have children and they don't have a partner that share the responsibilities. Is it the government that's going to fix it? No. But it's not even when you when the partner or when women speak up, skip up, uh, speak up about it, saying, "Oh, you are victimizing yourself." So this is what happened in the liberty movement and in the conservative mo movement many times. And what is the left leftist movement doing? They are listening to them, but they are addressing it wrong. They are addressing it wrong, saying, "Oh, now we are going to have like quotas." for women in business. Or no, right now we're gonna have the paid parenting living and, and only for women. And then these are policies, there are, they have the unseen consequences, but they are addressing the, the, the questions, what, they, what women uh, need. And we know not everybody understand the economic uh, consequences or the economic logic or the science of economics. So this is why what's happening and what's been happening and we are like not paying attention on it is that women are becoming much more uh, vocal it's in the liberty movement, in the conservative movement, but the movement doesn't change and it's not welcoming. So this is what, what, this is what we are trying to do. What, what would the movement, we call it the liberty movement, although I'm not convinced it's fully a movement. <laughs> so... So what would we do differently to bring a woman over to just go, you're right, 
government is oppressing me, freedom will free me and even give me more security than the, what, how, how do we, how do we say that? Help me talk to the ladies. <laughs> well, the first step is of course, we know we are in a well-educated country. Women here have access to a, at least the basic uh, school. So we're not talking about an ignorant uh, country on which we are talking about 70% of children do not have access to the basic. That's not the case here. But still, they don't have the best education. And how do we address that? How do we talk to them when they don't know? It's not telling them that what they want and then don't know how to address is like being a victim. Many times you don't want to listen that you are a victim. Especially if you're talking about a real problem that you face, it doesn't come from the government, it comes from the society. And we know we're in the society, so we know many problems comes from the government, some comes from the society. And I will uh, bring w another one, because I, s I mentioned raising children, women doesn't like to to do it by themselves anymore because it puts them out of the job market. And how do you become empowered? It's by your job. It's when you don't rely financially on, on anyone. Which is why government needs to pay for daycare and government <laughs> needs to have full day uh, kindergarten and uh, K through 12 so moms can go out into the workforce. Obviously, government is the answer there to help you raise your child. So. That's the answer that has been given to them. And what is the answer? The answer is changing the behavior of society, how men behave too. How men, that's why many women are, are delaying when they want to get pregnant because they want to make sure they're going to have uh, the independence to raise, like not relying so much on men. And not only that, and like I'm not, be, I'm, I'm not being, I'm not offending you, right? Oh, I'm You're very, okay. very offended. But like we are trying to change this in society, not only sharing more, unless we don't want women to work, unless we want to get back to the 50s. And then we want like men to provide everything and then women at home. That's not a society that we are going to have anymore. Well, let, let, me, let me put out my proposition. But I was about to, oh, just to talk about the second issue. It's just because raising kids is like something very reliable and we know that's, it, that's an issue. And I don't want the government. This is a private solution. And how do we address? Talking and discussing and putting the men in the table to share the responsibilities too. And, the, the, and it's not victimization, I'm pretty sure. And the second point. I mean, you want me to spend time with my children? I don't even like my children. <laughs> well, so now we need, we need to call the government to take care <laughs> of it. <laughs> All right, let me, let me just throw this out. It seems to me, you, you mentioned the 50s, and the 50s give us this image of, uh, you wouldn't know, leave it to Beaver or Ozzie and Harriet, but we get the idea of women stay home, take care, everybody's happy. But a woman's security, really throughout history, has been choosing the right man. If you can choose the right man, you're going to do okay. If you, if you marry Ward Cleaver, you can, you can live a nice uh, middle-class lifestyle. Well, that's gone. I think it's good that it's gone. But I worry that women have traded marrying a man for security to marrying the government. That Prince Charming is now the government. Which means, good, I don't have to have just one man, but I want this security. And it's the security, I think, that draws women to the left. Uh, and I think, I think there's a million reasons why, but how do we tell women, you, you just signed up to marry an abuser, that your new boyfriend is, is a really violent, awful drunk, and it might sound great now, but there really isn't security in the long run because this is going to blow up. That's not, a, that's not an easy message to get out. How do we get it out? It's addressing the unseen consequences. We need to let them know who is paying for the kindergarten, who is, how many women are going to be out of the job market because of the parenting uh, leave, the paid parental leave? So this is how we address it. But how do we convince these people to uh, believe and trust in these ideas? It's not suddenly. We need to keep them on the movement. We need to, and it's, it takes a lifetime to keep someone believing in certain uh, policies. 
So that's why our mission is to keep this uh, movement a safe split, a safe space to bring more women and to 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 um, turn it welcome and safe. Another thing, because we've been talking about children, we need to be honest and no offense again that sexual harassment and sexual assault are real yeah, problems. Real. And this is a good, and, and you know what is good? This is a, this is, we are in a country where women can complain only about that. We're not complaining about uh, big rates of uh, rapes on the streets. We're not complaining about, oh, you can get stoned on the street if you shit on your husband. We're talking about a country where women got in this, in this point where they can complain about sexual harassment, sexual assault in the job market or whatever, or whatever they are where it can well, happen, and it cannot be seen as a victimization. It cannot. It, it needs to be addressed in a professional and adult way. So any time that we close our eyes for this, the leftists, they are addressing that. That's, not, that's what's not happening if you see the right. They are still seeing, many people say, oh, it doesn't, it, it's not true. It, didn't, it, it has never happened to me. Or... So this is a real problem that we should address. Do you think men on the right say it doesn't happen? I think they do see that it happens, but there is a worry about accusers mm -hmm. and, and false accusations um, and destroying people's lives. I know of a case uh, in my hometown where a student was accused of something, uh, years later, fully exonerated, but his life is now ruined. He's been kicked out of school. He has, it's through the media, and now for any time he's gonna get hired, they're gonna do a Google search on him and see that he's a date rapist, when in fact, um, the courts threw it out uh, with, <laughs> with prejudice. So, you know, there's, there's this, this give and take, but let's, let's talk about Lola outside uh, yeah, the okay. country as well. Mm -hmm. You know, this in America is one thing, but women usually are not getting raped on a public bus as they are in India. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is a different world. And when I see women talk about uh, how oppressive it is in the United States, I just think go into any other country that's not a Western country mm -hmm. and take a look uh, at, um, at what we should be fighting for too. And your organization it's not an American organization. It's a global organization. Where, where are you focusing? Well, we're a grassroots organization. So we are, very, we, we are, we are in the bottom up of, the, of many countries. And look, as you said, uh, in the, we're talking about India, where you can get raped in the bus. And we're also talking about many countries in Africa, where we are, where they are fighting against the female mutilation process. Considering that we are international, we do not bring top-down uh, topics. Like, I, we cannot say what they need to be discussing, what they should be discussing in Africa or India or in Latin America, because we have different issues. So in Brazil, for instance, let me tell you something that happened that still is reality in Brazil now. What day is today? Like 28th, March 2022. Women cannot get their uh, tubes tight, the tight tubes, mm -hmm. unless they follow a, a huge set of requirements, including the husband consentment. And it's like it comes from the law. So who is really uh, oppressing you? Is your husband? No. In this case, it's not. In this case, it comes from law, from a law made and by whom? Do women in Brazil understand? Because at first you go, my husband won't let me get this form of birth control. My husband is oppressing me. But as you said, no, your husband isn't oppressing you. The state is oppressing you by empowering mm -hmm. somebody over you. Mm -hmm. That's what many people don't get. And so how, how do they see it? like as a patriarchy, patriarchy um, heritage or something. Like that. And come on, it, it, it must be because who wrote this law? A bunch of men. I'm sure there was no women in this moment. But to be fair, 
the same applies for the man who wants to do the vasectomy. But we're talking about something different because even to get your tube tights in Brazil, you need to follow other requirements such as you can only do it after the doctor tried to convince you otherwise. <laughs> you can only do it after 30 days of, uh, of your delivery. And so you follow lots of to do something that's very simple and supposedly on your own body with no issues. We are not talking about any moral issue Is right this here. a government issue or is it a Catholic issue because Brazil is a wildly Catholic country? But that's the problem anytime that religion takes the government and then they are enforcing some religious law on you. Same thing in Taliban. Of course, not in the same level. We're talking about things that are different of preventing women of going to college or school and tightening your tubes that you can do illegal and like many doctors are willing to do that. But then we put the privileged woman that can do it regardless and the poor women that cannot. And so they're on that cycle on which they get pregnant and they're going to have another ba another child in a poverty situation. So... This is what we're... So I wanted to bring this case specifically. And in Brazil, the mem our members, our Lola members, decided that it was something that was a women's issue and nobody was really taking care of it. And we decided to elect women to change it. Elect women to government. How do you change this law if so it's you, not by the government? So Ladies of Liberty Alliance in Brazil started recruiting women to run for public office. Yes, in the Libertarian Party there, which is called Novo in Portuguese. What does that stand for? What does that translate New, to? new. New party. New, right. new party, yeah. All right. So the new party, and was there any success? We had, in 2020, we had our local elections, and then we were with 13 members of Lola running for office. We elected six. Wow. But for local, so they do not have power to change federal right. law. So, but this year we are going to have federal elections and we do have members who are willing to run for office. That seems counterintuitive in that when I think of women in office, overwhelmingly, I think of socialists. Mm -hmm. I look in Congress, I think of socialists who are there. I look in the Colorado legislature at Faith Winter. I look at um, uh, our city councilwoman, Cedabach. These are communists, and they know how you should live your life. It completely <laughs> switches the narrative if women are elected who believe in libertarian philosophy. This is, uh, this is what we're trying to do there. And many of and an, an interesting fact on this regard. Last year in December, some months ago, we had a training with Joe, Joe Jorgensen, mm -hmm. she, because our members are big, huge fans of her. So she trained our Brazilian members to run for office. Not that she trained, she shared her right. experiences, of course. Like, what can we do with her here? For those who don't know, she was a libertarian, I believe, presidential candidate. Yeah, exactly. Well, I hate to break this to you. She didn't do so well here. I know that, but she's still uh, a candidate for the uh, president of the United States on the eyes of our Brazilian members. So we read like that. She was the third, okay, on the running. So that's she's how we read third. it. Yeah. <laughs> she's even third. All right. You mentioned something about India. Is Lola active in India as well? Yes. Over what issue? Right now, what India is facing, the government is uh, preventing women of wearing some uh, religious items on school, such as, as we know, the, very, the big uh, polemic hijab. And we're all about, and this is another thing about in this country that even Tocqueville saw it and like when he came here in the 18th century. This is a country where people respect religion. We're talking about a country, if you're wearing a hijab, that's pretty much because you can and you want. And if you is don't it? want, if you, that's the same thing. You, you can have the same level of oppression from a Muslim family in the U.S., from a conservative uh, Christian family. So if you are in this family, 
I'm sorry, you have a, and you don't want to follow the rules, you have a problem, okay, so, no matter the religion. So, in America, a woman doesn't have to wear a hijab, but my sense is, culturally, and I could be wrong, maybe she wears it with pride, I see the hijab as, um, as an oppressive thing, that this is, you, you can't show your hair to other men because they might get turned on, and you're my property, and so you're going to cover up. You know, I see women in uh, a burqa. I remember taking my kids to Disneyland, and there's a wife or two following a guy, hottest day imaginable, uh, wearing a black tent, and he's in shorts and a Budweiser T-shirt. So I'm thinking, this, this is oppression. This is this is this is might not be government oppression if it's here because those women can 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 take off their burqa any time, but it still seems like oppression to me well i i like i i'm not gonna go into the uh i don't wear anything religious so i'm not a religious person and i feel that all religion try to oppress women we see the nuns i never know how to pronounce it the nuns they right. wear it too by choice mm -hmm. And here in the U.S., and we have other religions on which women do not show their legs, do not show. And how, how much are they being really oppressed? Can we really compare when we're talking about the U.S.? We're not talking about yeah. the, the situation there. And another thing, you are, but I came from a Catholic uh, family. I don't Me know too. about you. Okay. So I came from a, a Catholic family. I went to Catholic schools. So I had all of the journey in the Catholic church. But it, but I don't follow it anymore because I am in a country on which I was, and here also, where I can pick what I'm gonna follow and what I'm gonna, I'm not gonna follow. That's not the case in many countries. In the U.S., it is. If I think it's oppressive, I'm all about personal choice. Even if here we think it's oppressive, the hijab, who is the? Uh, bring it to India, though. Bring it to India. What is happening there? The government, say, the government thinks like you. They think these women are being oppressed. So that's my duty to, to protect them. Is it real? Who is uh, in charge of protecting them? These women that wear the hijab. Do they have religious freedom in India? Well, I don't know. I, well, they, they have tensions. They have made, no. So apparently One they don't. One of the beautiful don't. things about our founding the very first of our Bill of Rights, which was actually third when it was promo promoted, but still it's the first now, guarantees people the right that government stays out. Um, that's a beautiful thing. I don't think they have that in India. Is the law well-intentioned? My suspicion is probably. Or is it intolerant? I don't think so. Again, I look at the hijab as a way to to keep women under control. Do I want government to say, you can't wear one in public? No, not of course. That is, that is your choice. But I wish that other women would look at those women and say, you're, you're in America or you're in India. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that here. And I, I wonder why more women don't do that, at least in the United States. And I will let you know, because we're talking about faith too, we have Muslim uh, members, and we have Muslim members who work for Lola and come to the U.S., and they wear the hijab. So who am I right. to tell her, you are being oppressed by, the, by this hijab? Someone who went to college, someone who had, who had the same uh, level of professional experience as, as I had. So who am I to tell her, do not wear it? And at the same point, we have a cultural... Um, Cultural things coming from the Christian uh, religion, like women, women, we, we don't go to the beach and we don't do topless, but men can do it. So are, am I really being oppressed by not being able to do that? If you're in France or in many countries, no, the same rules apply. Not here in the U.S. Not here in the U.S. Not in Brazil, for instance, believe it or not. People, believe it or not, not in Brazil. I saw... So there are places... I live in a, a city where if a man can be topless, so can a woman. And often they do. 
and nobody Praise is the in, Lord. And nobody and nobody is entrapped because of right. it, right? In Brazil, very recently, in my hometown, like near the uh, Ecuador line, uh, someone was doing topless in her own gar garden, and then the neighbors called the cops on her. That happens so, here. Yeah. So, so is she being oppressed? Who is oppressing her? Why she cannot do it? Why we're talking only about the top of the body. We're not talking about the rest of the body. <laughs> so, and we have this kind of, uh, look, and I'm not here. I'm not in the place to say that the hijab's not oppressive. I don't want to take this place. Microphone there. Oh, okay. I don't want to take this place and say the hijab is not oppressive. First of all, because I think all religions, they tend to be much more oppressive to women. That's what I believe. And I came from a very religion, uh, religious family. But at the same time, I think it, it should be a choice. It should be. And we are raised, since we are little, on our religion. So it's hard to to. What is to it change. you want people who are listening now to do? What's the call to action? They want to get involved with Lola. Mm -hmm. And if they do, they're helping women, not just here, but women in India and women in Brazil and what other areas of the world do you have a, a good grassroots effort going in? Mm -hmm. We're pretty much here in almost all of the countries in Latin America, all, almost all the countries in South America, some countries in Africa, India, Israel, and oh my God, now I don't remember, but we're not in Europe yet. So to, we want to get, you want people to come to us it can be through our website or through our social media. We want to start new chapters because we want women to discuss these ideas, to be very buttoned up talking about how these policies are bad and discussing and understanding why many of the policies that we talked here are indeed bad. At the end of the day, they're not helping us. They're damaging and they're turning everything worse for us. Do you have a chapter in Colorado? Not yet. That's what so uh, you're one of the for things. Somebody. Yes, and Laura is helping me. Laura Carno, who yes. works with us at Independence. Yes, she's a fine lady. Um, so, just out of curiosity, so if a guy who thinks he's a woman wants to be part of Lola, would you let him? Well, Deirdre mm -hmm. McCloskey, for instance, she's on our board. Mm -hmm. So we we respect that too. Okay. We respect the transition. Yes, we accept trans women. There we go. Where do people go? Do you have a website? Yes. What is it? Ladiesofliberty.org. Ladiesofliberty.org. Isabella, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. It was an, such an honor to be here this talking about Lola. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.